Good evening. I'm the I'm Jonathan Nichols Pethick. I'm the uh, as I said the very fortunate director of the Polium Center for Contemporary Media. Um, I am uh, very fortunate because I get to introduce you and welcome you to the uh, signature event of the Polium Center Speaker Series, uh, the Kerner Commission at 50 Miles to Go. Uh, before I uh, turn it over, um, I want to say a few words of thanks to some people who helped make this happen. Um, I want to I want to thank Keith Neitenhelzer and the uh, <laughs> Pub <laughs> Public Occasions Committee for um, their their uh, help funding this. I want to thank the uh, Vice President for Academic Affairs, Ann Harris, for her help as well. I also want to point out and thank my um, really wonderful staff here at the PCCM, Amy Cherry. Marilyn Culler and Chris Newton in particular, who all have worked very hard to make things um, happen here. I also uh, want to thank uh, very specifically my colleague uh, Miranda uh, Spivak, who will be moderating the panel and who, whose brainchild this was uh, to bring it here, and who did uh, all the legwork to get it all done in terms of making sure we were here on this night right here, right now. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the mic over to Miranda. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Pulliam Center for Contemporary Media. We're really fortunate tonight to have three uh, experts in the civil rights movement and journalism and diversity in the media. Um, who remembers 1968? It was a pretty pivotal year. <laughs> Few of us do. Uh, it's hard to believe it was 50 years ago. And for those of you who might not have been uh, in cogent in 1968, uh, it sort of came on the heels of a lot of civil unrest in the United States. Um, you know, the civil rights movement was gaining ground. There were. Detroit had burned, there were many, many kind of distressing things that were going on. And then President Lyndon B. Johnson, who I think to lots of people looks pretty good in retrospect, um, had already gotten through the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, and he actually commissioned uh, what was then called the Kerner Commission to investigate the problems in the United States that were leading to civil unrest. The Kerner Commission was chaired by uh, Governor Otto Kerner of Illinois. Um, like many Illinois politicians, he subsequently went to prison. <laughs> but at the time, <laughs> he was uh, he conducted a pretty interesting commission. Um, Fred Harris, who's the only living member of the commission now, uh, living former senator from um, Oklahoma, and um, John Lindsay, uh, the then mayor of New York, were on the commission, as were many others. And the commission came up with some disturbing, uh, but very, I think, openly, uh, at the time, really kind of forward-thinking views that weren't necessarily being articulated. And it, um, the commission found that the nation, our nation is, was moving towards two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. The commission called for expanded aid to African American communities in order to prevent further racial violence and polarization. And they said if this did not happen, the continuing polarization of the American community and ultimately there would be the destruction of basic democratic values. The report identified more than 150 riots or major disorders between 1965 and 1968, including the deadly Newark and Detroit riots, and blamed, quote, white racism for sparking the violence, not a conspiracy by African-American political groups, which uh, J. Edgar Hoover and others had claimed. Uh, it was a pretty troubling time. Uh, the Kerner Commission issued its report on February 29th. I guess it was a leap year in 1968. Mm -hmm. And um, then, uh, you know, about six weeks later, Martin Luther King was assassinated, and a month or so, two months later, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, and then in 19, in um, August in Chicago was the Democratic Convention, where there were also I incredible riots. And so it was, it was, it's an interesting time to look back on. It's hard to believe, for me, that it was 50 years ago, because I was alive and thinking at this mm -hmm. time. Um, so tonight we have three very distinguished guests. Uh, Paul Delaney, a veteran Prince journalist who spent 23 years with the New York Times. He was the first black reporter in the Washington Bureau of the New York Times. We have living history right here. 
Um, he was also the first black reporter in the Chicago Bureau of the New York Times and with the first black news editor in the New York Times National Desk. And the stats aren't so good, <laughs> even today, at major news organizations. Uh, Paul Delaney began his career with the Atlanta Daily World, which was a, an African-American newspaper, and subsequently eventually made his way back to the Dayton Daily News, where he discovered many of his uh, colleagues, classmates who were white from Ohio State University. The had, Ohio State the, University. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> God. Uh, had already beat him to the Dayton Daily News. Uh, he also eventually became uh, the bureau chief for the New York Times in Madrid. Uh, he is a graduate of The Ohio State <laughs> University, majored in journalism. He was a founding member of the National Association of Black Journalists and the National Association of Minority Media Executives. He's also been a member of the Overseas Press Club, the National Press Club. He served on the board of National Public Radio. And uh, he was also an editorial writer for the Baltimore Sun and taught, headed the journalism department of the University of Alabama. I'm not sure he ever slept. It might have been between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. <laughs> so um, I will then, uh, Paul's going to talk first, uh, and then I'll introduce Richard Prince. And after that, I will introduce Ava Thompson Greenwell. So why don't you go ahead and sort of set the stage for us, if you would. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. DePaul University. I'm going <coughs> to, if you don't mind, I'll step up here. Um, 50 years, mine. I guess when, when one speaks in terms of uh, half a century, you're, you're getting old, or I call it maturing. Uh, <coughs> I was a young reporter at the Washington Evening Star uh, when the Kerner Commission uh, was formed. And it, I had been a witness to many of the problems that the commission uh, tackled at the time. Um, I covered a lot of the issues. Um, um, I had lived uh, the race story prior to becoming a journalist. <clears throat> I was born and raised in, in Montgomery, Alabama, a hothead, uh, a, hothead a hotbed of, <laughs> of, <laughs> of, uh, of racism, uh, to say the least. You've read about it, uh, I'm sure. You might have heard of George Wallace, <laughs> who said segregation today, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Of course, he was wrong on that. Uh, my family escaped, I mean, my family moved to Cleveland um, when, uh, during the great uh, migration, this, the great black migration from the South. You know, you're gonna hear a lot of things tonight that you really should investigate later uh, research uh, because it's great history like the Great Migration or George Wallace. But <coughs> we moved to uh, Cleveland, uh, thank goodness, and that's when I um, went to Ohio State and graduated in, in journalism. Um, the North was the great escape for, 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 for most of us leaving the South, but it didn't end uh, racism. Um, it only, as history showed, made it, well, you remember the, we mentioned the rioting, the riots of the 1960s. Uh, Tension was high across the nation at the time. Um, and that's when President Johnson appointed the Kerner Commission. I covered many commissions and committees in Washington, D.C., and most of them were, were, were appointed to gloss over whatever the issue was, and I think LBJ named the Kerner Commission to do just that, to kind of gloss over, he hoped, uh, the racial problems. 
in America. Um, he, um, but if you read the report as has been recommended, it was a biting, a stinging report. It was an excellent report, one of the, 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 the better uh, written, better stories to come out of Washington uh, involving a commission or a committee, to be quite honest about it. So if you haven't read it, um, I think you should. It was received at the time with a lot of enthusiasm. I remember I was, well, m most of us was very impressed uh, with its findings and its recommendations. Um, you've heard uh, uh, Miranda mentioned the one, uh, 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 one of the, uh, I guess, the most memorable statements that came out of the, the uh, report about we're going our separate ways. Uh, America was becoming two nations, one black, one white. And over the years, <coughs> I've uh, had the, the great fortune to cover and watch as the nation has gone in separate paths, unfortunately. Um, I would, uh, I, I, think I'll, I think I'll end it right there, um, since Miranda gave you a little bit of my <laughs> own personal background, and I'll wait for the Q&A that I would hope you would zing us with some good ones. <laughs> um, we're used to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Um, Richard Prince, to my left, is a former colleague of mine at the Washington Post. Uh, he got there before I did, um, and then he came back. But uh, at the moment, Richard is the um, editor and reporter for a website on diversity in the media. It's probably the premier website in the United States that tracks diversity and in the media and diversity issues. It's called Journal-Isms. You can find it online. Um, Richard is, uh, I guess, went to the Post in um, 1968. Uh, he was covering local news. By 1972, he and six other African-American reporters at the Post decided they basically looked around the room and said, things aren't going right here. And they filed a complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which led to uh, some improvement in hiring. Uh, it also sparked other suits around the country or complaints around the country uh, by other uh, minority journalists who realized that they were seemed to be vastly underrepresented in the newsroom. And of course, one of the big reasons to have a diverse root newsroom is to be sure that you're able to cover all communities and that all communities are represented. Uh, Richard then left um, and he had went on to a, a, a very storied career, but then he came back to the Post <laughs> as, a, as an editor on the Foreign Desk. Um, and he's the recipient of the Ida B. Wells Award from the National Association of Black Journalists, which is- And Medill School. And mm -hmm. Medill, mm -hmm. which is where our other speaker is from. Uh, he also got the Robert Magruder Award from Kent State for his promotion of diversity in the news business, as well as the Penn Oakland Award. He's, uh, he has a lot of honors. Uh, he also was at the founding editor of the Black College Wire, a news service for black college students that aimed to improve college newspapers around the country. Before that, he was the first black editorial writer at the Democrat and Chronicle in Rochester, and he worked there from 79 to 94. Um, and uh, I mean, too many other numerous uh, accolades, but um, Richard will now sort of pick up the story where Paul left off. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, sorry. Okay, good evening everybody. I'm um, uh, Paul sort of left off with his career in the in the, yeah, I do, so he, he talked about what it was like in the 50s and 60s. I didn't, uh, I wasn't around quite uh, that early, but I was around in, uh, in 1967 for the 
for the uh, urban unrest in Newark, New Jersey. And I was a college student, uh, and I was covering that riot. They said I was all hands on deck. And, uh, and then I stayed around. I was working during the summers and on weekends for the aftermath of what, what went on. Uh, so I know a little about what, what they were talking about in the, uh, in the uh, Kerner Commission report. Now, uh, then I graduated in this momentous year of 1968. Uh, and when I first walked into that newsroom in the Washington Post, uh, as a college student about to graduate, I was surprised by how many black people I saw. It was, I said, wow, I was used to, you know, in the New York area and Newark and all that, there were like one or two at the most. And then when I saw, you know, five and six and seven and eight and nine and 10, I said, wow. However, when I have gone back to the Washington Post recently, uh, I'm surprised by how few black people I see in that newsroom. Uh, and I think the, um, expectations have changed over those 50 years. Uh, what was acceptable back in 1968 is not acceptable now. Uh, so I want to home in today on two key observations from the Kerner Report. As you may know or will learn, uh, they had a whole chapter just about the media and the media's role in, um, in creating the conditions for the urban rioting that took place in the 60s. Number one, they said, the journalistic profession has been shockingly backward in seeking out, hiring, training, and promoting Negroes. And secondly, the world that television and newspapers offer to their black audiences is almost totally white in both appearances and, and this is important, attitude. Now make no mistake, 50 years later, there are far more African Americans in the news business than there were in 1968. When I, as I said, when I entered the business, there was perhaps one or two, if that, per, per newsroom. And now we have Latinos, Asian Americans, and a sprinkling, just a sprinkling of, Asian, of, of Native Americans. But even those in the news business admit the progress has been disappointing. Mizell Stewart III, who was a USA Today Network executive, and by the way, the Indianapolis Star is part of the, is the USA Today Network, who last year was president of the American Society of News Editors, wrote members then, in my more pessimistic moments, I believe our industry has made little progress since 1968. That is not because of a willful disregard for diversity. On the contrary, Countless programs and initiatives are in place with the goal of bringing persons of color and women into the industry. And women and persons of color occupy top positions in media organizations of all stripes. The lack of progress is palpable because the continuing transformation of, the media, of media business models has led to dramatic reductions in newsroom employment particularly in local newspapers. Now when he says change in media business models, he means the internet has taken away a lot of the advertising money that, that, that uses to support the people in the newsroom. So that has caused a lot of havoc. Um, in many uh, legacy news organizations, moving, the, this is what I'm quoting still, moving the needle on staff diversity took a back seat to the survival of the enterprise. Now, in those, what those legacy news organizations failed to take into account is our nation's changing demographics. We are becoming a majority-minority nation, and those are our customers. So Mizell offered one explanation. Others say the pro lack of progress is because the will just isn't there. Contrast what Mizell Stewart was saying with the words of John Quinn, who died last year, and in 1982 was a founding editor of USA Today. Benny Ivory, who is now retired as editor of the Louisville Courier Journal and is a black journalist, called Quinn, the, quote, the conscience of Gannett for many years, 
having inspired the most aggressive diversity movement of the 20th century. That's saying something. Uh, but John Quinn walked the walk on diversity and helped pave the sidewalk. When USA Today commemorated its 25th anniversary in, in 2007, Quinn explained to me from my journalism's column how the newspaper assembled its inaugural staff. It was a little frustrating, Quinn said. Some of my colleagues would say, I know this great person who can do what we want. We said, we've got a lot of those. We've got to have somebody else. And sometimes that meant going outside Gannett, which was the nation's largest newspaper company. But his approach worked. The percentage of people of color at USA Today's founding, Quinn said, exceeded that of the nation, as well as of the newspaper industry. Of the five managing editors, two were women. At the level below them were two more women and two African Americans. The average age was 30. More important, he said, we had the talent we needed. Now, there are other reasons for this lack of progress that maybe we can discuss with our, when we get going with our panel. Number one, the competition of the internet seduces many would-be black journalists into writing opinion pieces. And that means they never have to learn the unglamorous work of going through documents, looking for the right material that will uncover wrongdoing or a misapplication of justice. Number two, the devaluation of coverage of community issues affecting our people of color. This means that even some journalists of color consider it pigeonholing to write about other people of color. Combined with other factors, this has meant that many of the big stories involving African Americans, the stories that truly make a difference and burnish one's career, are written by white journalists. Then we have the issue of retention. And this is, some of these things that I'm talking about are not just in the news business, they're in industry in general. Should somebody be thrown into the newsroom or on the job and sink or swim? Or do you have a responsibility once you've hired somebody to work with them, nurture them, and make sure they succeed? People have different approaches to that. And moreover, and this is something I discussed with, uh, with uh, our class earlier today, the inadequate pre preparation of the grade school, at the grade school level, in the skills that make for good journalists. Reading, writing, and most of all, critical thinking skills. So those are some of the items I want to put on the table, and I think we'll hear more about them as the evening progresses. I hope so. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. All right. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Ava Thompson Greenwell. She is a professor at Northwestern in the Medill School, and she's also a um, has held several administrative posts at at Medill, uh, including associate dean. Her research is on the intersection of race, gender, and journalism. She her dissertation uh, explored the history and experience of black women television news managers. And you're going to have to tell us how you found them, because I cannot imagine. It was actually own. pretty easy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and she's working on a documentary now on the history of Chicago activism in the Free South Africa movement. She, too, is the curator of the Ida B. Wells ad uh, Award, which Richard got. And uh, that is administered annually by the National Association of Black Journalists. And um, she's also a former TV reporter in Tampa, Minneapolis, and Evansville, Indiana. And has also done freelancing for television stations in Chicago. Um, and we will now hear from Dr. Greenwell. Thank you so much. So thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. I know you could be many other places other than here. And so I certainly want to uh, applaud you for that. And also thank you for inviting me to be here. 
So this has sort of been uh, a love of mine for a while, just sort of an, an interest, um, having been a former reporter in newsrooms. So I, I want to make sure that you understand the legends who preceded me uh, and to make sure that we give them their just due because certainly I stand on their shoulders because they preceded me. When I walked into my first television news job in 1985, I think there had been, there had been other African Americans in the newsroom. And so the good thing is I wasn't the first. Now, I think what we will see as time moves on this evening is that while there has been progress, uh, the progress has been very slow, and during the last couple of decades, it really has remained a little stagnant. So I just want to share with you just a little bit of my research, but also put it in the context of the Kerner Commission Report. So we're now uh, 50 years beyond the Kerner Commission Report. And one of the things that I think is uh, really important, and let's see if we can get this moving the way it's supposed to. So I think what we, we will do is, uh, while I am trying to um, get this going here, is uh, one of the things that we did uh, 10 years ago is we interviewed uh, managers who are part of the McCormick Fellows Program. And these managers were people who worked not only in television, but also in the print area. And, and I wanted to make sure that I shared with you a little bit of what they had to say. So this is 10 years ago uh, and what their perspective was on the Kerner Commission Report. Um, the other point that I wanted to make about the Kerner Commission Report, which unfortunately um, did not come up in my presentation, presentation is the language that was used, as was mentioned earlier, was a language of urgency. And it was also a language really meant to sort of light a fire under the people who were working in the industry, as well as the people who could hire and fire. And one of the important things about the specifics of the report was this idea that it was, wasn't enough just to hire one or two. At that time, the word that was used was Negroes. And I wanted to show you uh, what that language was. It said that what we really needed to do uh, was we needed to have not only more uh, black people in newsrooms, but we also needed to have more black people in editor and management positions. And that's the area that I think is really, really critical. Because these are the gatekeepers, the people who are deciding who's going to be hired, who's going to be fired, the people who are deciding the kind of coverage that will actually occur. And particularly in television, this is germane, because in television, it's very easy to have a black face in front of the audience. But what's more um, important is to really have people of diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds and also socioeconomic backgrounds behind the scenes so that they are bringing stories to the newsroom that would not ordinarily be there. So that gatekeeper function, I think, is really, really important. And so what I wanted to share with you, and let's see if um, is a little bit of the video that we have produced, keeping in mind that this, this was 10 years ago. We are now 50 years instead of 40 years uh, into the Kerner Commission report. And um, I'm just going to play a little bit of excerpt. Yeah. So again, these were some on-air people, some managers as well. OK, here we go. The past are doomed to repeat it. Basically, I'm an optimist. But I do worry sometimes that because we didn't, we didn't listen to ourselves when we knew that there was a problem, not only in terms of uh, staffing, but in pro providing coverage that we've basically sort of written our fate. I think the struggles that were back in the newsrooms in 68 are pretty much essentially the same as they are now. Not enough representation, not enough accuracy, not enough self-determination, not enough understanding the demographic change and the fact that inclusiveness in diversity is good for business and it's good for audience and readership and listenership. I also have a sense that I'm not sure I've made that big a difference, nor can I, because I still feel like a bunch of old white men are running the industry and it's really not going to change that much until they go away. And I don't think they're going away, to be quite honest and candid. You know, we don't own the companies, but we certainly uh, work in them and can have influence. And I think that we have to, we have to keep the fight going. 
I, I see a lot more native publications. I see a lot more native radio stations, websites, newsletters that report on you know the true story. Because what we hear is not because I don't think apathy anymore. Is it? I don't understand native issues. There are a lot of wonderful, good people who are not people of color who are out there fighting the fight as tough as we are, as hard as we are. By that same token, for everyone that's out there fighting the fight, who really gets it, who's trying to make diversity happen, who tries to run a fair and balanced newsroom, there's one out there who does not get it. 40 years later, we're still we still dance around the topic of racial issues. Um, we're not doing the in-depth kind of coverage. If we give up hope, then there's no reason for me to be in the business. I think there's still suspicion um, in our community um, with regards to the media. Um, and um, all too often, um, the, the depiction of stereotypes still show up on the uh, evening news. A realization that you no longer live and a mostly white America. And a, real, a realization that nobody's gonna buy the newspaper if they can't use it. And if they don't see themselves in it, they can't use it. As this unity brings together journalists of color, I think there needs to be statements and, uh, and a renewed commitment to push uh, our leaders in the media and to understand that this is not about social engineering, this is not being a good guy, this is about serving, fulfilling their jobs as journalists. What we want to do uh, on this anniversary of the current commission, 40 years later, is to help people see that uh, the intertwined problems of race and poverty are still with us. Uh, and uh, to get around this myth that grew up during the Reagan administration that everything we tried to fail. The truth is that everything we tried is virtually everything worked. Uh, we just stopped trying. Uh, or uh, we stopped trying as part of us. So I want to stop it there with Fred Harris because as you heard earlier, Fred Harris is one of the remaining uh, one of the only uh, original members of the Kerner Commission report. And I think his point is really something that we want to chew on uh, this evening, and that is there were specific ways and specific programs that helped to bring people of color into the newsroom and to bring women into the newsroom. And those things were working. And I think what we will see, um, if, if my slides were working, I would show you some numbers from uh, RTDNA, which is the Radio Television Digital News Association, and they've been keeping track of the number of people of color, particularly African Americans, in news uh, probably since, I say, the late early 80s, early 90s. And what it shows is that between, say, around 1968, when the Kerner Commission actually first came out, no one was really keeping track of that. But some of the estimates were anywhere in the range from 2 to 5% for blacks in management in television news. So we, we fast forward to 1995, and we moved up to 10%, right? So we have made some improvements in terms of blacks in management. But when we move from 1995 to 2016, the increase is only 1%, 11%. So we've gone from 2% to 10% to 11%. Okay, so this, this documents and shows the stagnation that, that we're experiencing. And so the, the big question I think in all of this should be, well, why? What, is it, what does it matter? Why does it matter that our newsrooms are diverse? Why is it important that they be diverse? So not only do they bring a diverse uh, opinion, um, it's important to have those different ideas. So in the research that I did, I looked at uh, 40 uh, black women New, television news managers. These are women who were executive producers, assistant news directors, news directors. I actually found about 100 in the U.S. and they're actually probably a little bit more. So that was surprising that I found that many. And 40 of them agreed to be interviewed. And what I found in uh, you know, going through all the interviews is that here's how they make a difference. They make a, z a difference in hiring and mentoring because they are much more likely to hire people who look like themselves, but also hire people who've been marginalized, right? So they understand what it means not to necessarily be uh, seen as valuable.
The other thing they do is they really look at coverage in a way that's critical, but in a way that values black people. And one example I'll share with you, actually two examples I'll share with you had to do with a news director who was in um, a small town in the South, and there had been someone in their community who was very prominent, prominent African American who died. And so this particular news director decided that she was going to blow out all the coverage and cover the funeral live. Similar to what we sort of saw when, for example, Whitney Houston died, right? So CNN covered that story uh, and covered it uh, live. So she decided to do this. And so she went to her general manager and said, I want to do this. This is, a pro this is a prominent person in our community. Community, mind you, is about 50% black. And her general manager said, sure, go ahead with it. She did it, and she got all kinds of accolades from viewers themselves who said, thank you, thank you so much for really valuing this person. It was important for us to have this funeral. Her general manager said to her, you know, I'm really glad you did this, but guess what? Nobody else in the past had ever asked to even do it. And surprisingly or not surprisingly, they had never had an African American in a leadership role as the news director there. Another example that I wanted uh, to share with you also had to do with, again, valuing uh, black bodies. So I know earlier this evening you just heard from one of the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement, and she talked a lot about the importance of valuing black lives. And so this is one of the other areas that I found that black females who are in leadership roles and gatekeeper roles really look at the coverage critically and say, for example, one woman talked about how there had been a young black female, a teenager, who had been missing for several days. Have you all, are you all familiar with missing white woman syndrome? Okay, so that's a term that actually has been coined for the news media, particularly at the national level, when they uh, really go after coverage of white females. And it tends to be white attractive females as well. So names like Natalie Holloway, right? Um, become household names. Why? Because news organizations cover their story over and over. But when it comes to males and people of color, those stories generally aren't treated with the same kind of respect and the same kind of repetition that you find with white females. So this particular black female who was in charge that particular night had noticed that the police report had said that this young black female had been missing for several days. And so she went to the anchor and said, I think we need to cover this because we need to value this person just as much as we value any other people who would go missing. And the anchor, who happened to be a white male, said, oh, she's probably a runaway. We don't need to cover her. So she made a decision that they were going to be covering that story for that particular night. So that's just an, another example that I found, an example after example after example of how having a black woman in the gatekeeper role made a difference in how people were covered. And often as a general audience, you don't know what was not there, right? You don't know wasn't, what was not covered. And so I want you to think about this, you know, as you go home tonight and hopefully watch news, whether it's tonight or whether it's tomorrow, think about all those stories that don't get told. And think about how those stories might be told differently if there were people uh, in those roles that maybe are different other than being white and other than being male. So again, with the research that, that, that I did, one of the things that I would like to continue doing is also looking at uh, black women in other countries. I run a program in South Africa, and so one of the areas that I'm going to be looking at is black women who are in news in South Africa and what their experience might be like compared to uh, women in, in the U.S. So with that, I will wrap it up. Again, I apologize for the PowerPoint presentation. Blame it on Russia, right? Um, <laughs> it, it disappeared. Uh, you can talk to one of your uh, audio persons there. It was there before we started, and now it was, it's not sir. there. So don't know what happened with that, but I think that will give us at least enough material to work with so that we can have a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to add a little bit of uh, <coughs> statistics to what um, Dr. Green Greenwell said, that um, the Women's Media Center just came out with a report of status of women of color in the U.S. news media 2018, mm -hmm. and they, said they found that um, in print newsrooms, women of color represented just 
roughly 8%, 7.95% of U.S. print newsrooms, 12.6% of local TV news staff, and 6.2% of local radio staff. Um, I, you know, I don't know how that compares to the past, but it doesn't sound like a lot, lot to me. No. Um, so it's just sort of another data point to think about. Um, I'd like to ask a few questions, and then I think we would love to hear from the audience. So um, you had mentioned, Dr. Greenwell, that the Kerner Commission language had a sense of urgency about it. So what has happened? <laughs> Why is it no longer urgent? Uh, well, so uh, there's no teeth to it, right? This is strictly voluntary. So it's up to news organizations to decide whether they want to do anything and what exactly they want to do. I mean, I think that's the real issue. This is not mandatory. It's up to you to decide. And I think also there was some urgency. There was push on the part of uh, organizations, media coalitions that formed and also put pressure on news organizations. And then remember for television, back then we had the FCC, right? And the FCC, which <coughs> was a much stronger government arm that could actually yank a license from a television station if they were not meeting the needs of the community. And that community would, would include people of color in the community. And so uh, since that is no longer really on the table for a lot of television stations, I think we had a situation where there's, there's pressure, there's push, there's a little bit of lighting of the fire, and then slowly it just kind of dies down. And, you know, we all know that if we're not pushed to do something, it may not necessarily happen out of, out of the goodness of their hearts. And I also think that there were just other, you know, the Internet came along, right? Mm -hmm. And that put all kinds of pressure on news organizations just to keep afloat. And as a result of that, diversity really got put on the back burner. And so now I think we have a situation that we have today, and that is, you know, things are kind of stagnant. Um, and, and while there certainly has been improvement, I don't, I don't want you to leave here thinking that there's been no improvement, because there has been imp improvement. But it's, the question is, how do you sustain that kind of improvement over time? Mm -hmm. You've got to put pressure on new <coughs> organizations. Richard, what, why, do, why does diversity matter? I mean, I hate to come to such a simple question, but I think it's actually worth articulating. Why does it, you know, all kinds of diversity in newsrooms in particular, I mean, other businesses we could talk about, but newsrooms we know about. Um, why does it matter to readers, communities, whatever? Yeah. Well, it matters because uh, we're in the business of, of being accurate. And if you want to present an accurate picture of, uh, of your community, then uh, you need to have all voices represented. The other, uh, other, other thing that uh, comes to mind is that uh, media organizations and, and communities, television stations, radio stations, newspapers, are sort of like the town hall uh, of that community in that they introduce one part of town to another part of town. One group of problems to the other. You know, I didn't know that that's what was happening on the other side of town, or that that's what the way these people felt. <coughs> and so, if you're not, if all those people aren't represented at the table or in your news organization, um, or in, in your news coverage, then you're not really giving a, a full view of what's going on in your community, and you're not really being accurate. Uh, so that's. And you know, yeah. I would add to that too. Yeah. Um, remember. Television in particular really shapes our impressions of who we are and who others are. I mean, think, think about the power, especially of the visual now. So whether it's Facebook, whether it's Twitter, whether it's the next social media, whether it's Vine, whatever it is, people are getting their impressions about who others are and who they should be even, especially, and I think about women, you know, the, the idea of women have to be a certain size, they have to be, your hair has to be a certain way. All of those impressions come from the media often, and particularly news media. Obviously, there are other types of media that, that shape that as well, but that is critical in our for formation of identity in this country. And if, if we're not seeing positive or we're only seeing negative, then that shapes our behavior, it shapes our actions, it shapes so much of we, what we do. This is why that gatekeeper function I think is so important and to me that's the next level 
in addition to trying to make sure we're representative of the communities we serve, to me the next level is really making sure that managers <coughs> are representative. And I think socioeconomically, that's another issue we haven't really talked about, and maybe at some point during the panel we can we can get into that. Um, because I, I can see something. I mean, you know, let's take for example a city like Chicago. One of the things I was going to show you two weeks ago, I moderated a panel in the Chicago area called Blacks in Broadcast. And these were um, African Americans who were in front of the camera. There was one black female who's a producer at Fox 32. And so we talked to them about wh what's missing. And in a city like Chicago, that is a third African American, a third Latino, and a third white, their management staff do not reflect that at all. They're still predominantly white and predominantly male. So you walk into a city that's the third largest city in the country, and this is what you will see. And that's problematic. Well, let me add one yeah. other thing, too. When you mention um, uh, it affects our <laughs> self-image and all that, it also affects public policy. Mm -hmm. And that's very important. And consider uh, how the, uh, the crack academic mm -hmm. epidemic of the 80s was covered versus the opioid credit uh, uh, crisis in the 2000s, and how one was presented as, you know, these thugs and what's happening. And the result was the three strikes and you're out law and all that. And the opioid um, uh, crisis that's going on now and the response being very sympathetic and let's pour some more money into this problem. And why is that? Because white people are dying? <laughs> well, there you go. And, yeah. and also, <laughs> also the media's representation of those two communities and what was, what was happening to each. I mean, it, as I said, it affects public policy as well. So it's not just, mm. you know, it, those self-image so th things are, are important, but it also affects where the dollars go. Yeah. So, Paul, yeah. When well, I wanted go to ahead. mention, yeah. going back to uh, <coughs> the, uh, the numbers and the impact uh, of, of, of Kerner. Pre previous prior to Kerner, uh, in the early, mid, and going into the late 1960s, there was improvement uh, flowing from <coughs> the riots and there was some that was a that was a push uh, the companies were, were in, at least in print were reaching out uh, at uh, being shamed by one the rioting uh, and people pointing out that you're all white etc and so the New York Times the Washington Post etc uh, Gannett in particular started hiring leading up to Kerner and, uh, and 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 Kerner, I think, added <coughs> more embarrassment with its really poignant um, um, criticism of the media. Uh, and you remember, the next uh, month after the Kerner report, uh, Dr. King was assassinated, and <coughs> that led to more rioting across the country, and more papers, more publishers deciding that. We, we, we've got to do something. And getting into the 70s, uh, there were lawsuits. The New York, uh, uh, the black reporters at the New York Times filed a lawsuit, a discrimination lawsuit against the New York Times in 1971. Uh, a year later, women filed a lawsuit against the New York Times. And later, a couple of years, well, actually, the women's suit was settled before the black suit. The black suit was settled uh, in 1981. But the point is, the numbers had started improving um, rather drastically going into the going into the 70s, 80s, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it did. Yeah. The numbers did uh, yeah. dip. Yeah, I, I think the other thing to add to that <coughs> is. Um, the journalism associations that were also forming around that time, mid 70s, NABJ. So there was a reference to unity there in the video. Unity is the Unity uh, Convention of Journalists, which you know started in 1995. And then every five years, uh, the Black Association, Native American, uh, Hispanic, uh, and uh, Asian, Asian American Association would come together <coughs> for one big conference. And so that happened also in 2008. But those organizations, too, were, at that time, really putting pressure yes, they on were. television stations, newspapers, magazines to, to hire. Now, once they got in, though, sometimes it became more difficult for them to put the pressure on the very same organizations that were writing their paychecks, one would say. And that, so, 
leads so, to my next question yeah. actually to Paul, which is when you got into management at the New York Times, how influential were you? It's difficult to say, and I'm huffing and puffing because uh, in, in, um, in managers' meetings, I was the only black person there. Uh, I made my points, um, I made my positions known, um, and they were largely ignored. Uh, and women had the same problem. Mm -hmm. yep. um, <coughs> and, and I was part of uh, the management team. It was called the XCOM, the Executive Committee. Not uh, XCON, huh? Com. <laughs> com. <laughs> and there, uh, there were the top senior editors at the Times, and it was about a dozen. And I was the only non white. There were two women. And uh, the women, well, well, I mean, we were all, most of our ideas were ignored. Uh, they were discussed, but then eventually ignored. So, so influence, I had influence uh, in, in coverage uh, of, of stories. I think we started looking at the non-white community more at the time. Uh, that was influence. I remember <coughs> another thing. Uh, I guess a lot of my influence was on the staff. Uh, young and, and minority staffers would come and, and uh, have, have sessions and tell me their problems and we'd work out things, having problems here with editors, with stories. And I remember once uh, a young black lady came and said, Paul, can I, can I have a word with you? We went in the office and talked and she left. And the white secretary on the desk said, Paul, <coughs> when you were young, and up, an upcoming journalist like this person was, did you have anybody that you could go and talk to like that? I said, no. Nah. Yeah. God, I don't see how you made it. Mm -hmm. And she was correct. So I had that kind of yeah. impact and influence. Well, you know, that was one of the other things about the Kerner Commission report and going to the stinging words. It specifically said, time out for tokenism, right? Just hiring one or two is not enough. You really need that critical mass. And I think we find that when there's a critical mass, uh, that mass is more likely to rise up and really uh, feel a little bit more empowered. It's very difficult when you're the only one. Oh, yeah. Right, to be in that kind of situation. Because you, you, you kind of know you're the only one, and you're reminded of it day in and day out. And so I, I think what's really important, I really urge you to go and, and read the report. Because I think you will find that it is, it is pretty scathing and it's pretty, uh, it, it really speaks truth to power at that time. And when I think about um, how it might have been difficult for some of those commissioners to actually write what they wrote. I mean, uh, Fred Harris talks about uh, there was some consternation among the committee members <coughs> about using the term racism even back then. And so he said, but we decided that we just needed to call it what it was. And so I think that that part really strikes a chord for me because then I think 50 years later, now what's the next report, right? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen 50 years from now in terms of where we are? And, I, and what would, we, what would mm -hmm. be if we wrote the report? Now? Well, mm -hmm. it, it, it should be another Kerner report, as stinging and biting as it was. Uh, I think, uh, as, as I mentioned, that report and, and again, I, in Washington, I covered a lot of commissions and committees that were appointed for various reasons. And, I, 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 and, and honestly, there was nothing ever before or since uh, like the current report. And you, you, re you really should read it. It'll, uh, you'll learn. And I'm proud to say one of my colleagues at the New York Times, it turned out, was one of the writers of the uh, commission, uh, Jack Rosenthal who is, I heard, <coughs> was credited with writing the, that, uh, that major, separate the separate but un and unequal, yeah. He wasn't at the Times at the time. No, he was, uh, he was, uh, yeah, he, 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 yeah, we, right, he, he joined the Times later. Room and if you'll talk into the microphone. Okay. So, if you have questions. 
So, Mr. Mr. Delaney, yes. um, in particular, but all of you, you you've all talked about how re the, the report was particularly biting and accurate, and used the term racism and so forth and so on. And you've praised it to the skies, um, but. What about its impact? Because on the other hand, you're saying it didn't seem to make much difference. So uh, well, maybe a little schizophrenia going on <laughs> up there, perhaps. It was. Uh, it wasn't totally ignored, and uh, in fact, that clip of, of, of Fred Harris went to that that very point that uh, it the president himself ignored it. He he didn't expect that kind of report. Therefore. Uh, not much was done. It wasn't ignored. It made an impact, but it, it you know, effectively, it was, it it was uh, not uh, not followed. There was little, fo not little, but there was not enough or much follow through. So, so I mean, if the Kerner Commission had not existed, would the world? Would the American world be much different than it is? Well, I, let me say this: that that, that, that it, it might not have had the the impact that we would have liked, and 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 overall, but in the media world, it did have an impact because newspapers and television stations uh, paid attention, and certain programs were started that are still in existence today. Um, uh, ten years after that, the American Society of News Editors. Uh, um, uh, set a goal mm. that the percentage of, of uh, people of color in newsrooms should equal the percentage of color people people of color in the general population by the year 2000. So that did not happen, but at least it was it was aspirational. It, it, they set in motion some ways to get there. The, the goal is still in effect. They're trying to now do it by 2025. That's not going to happen either. But they're mm -hmm. trying various things, and, and um, there were training programs that were set up. Uh, some people got hired. Uh, yeah. There are there there were some some, some yeah, concrete. You're right, and I think yeah. a lot of a lot of publishers, newspaper owners, were embarrassed when they from the stinging report, and and when they looked around and said, oh, "Well, it's true," and a lot of programs did uh, right. flow from uh, the report. So, so I think it helped when the pressure was on, mm -hmm. but as soon as you take the pressure off, right. then um, you don't get much improvement from there. So the sustainability, I think, of something that's voluntary and not really mandatory, it, it's, it's difficult to sustain. You know, you have new managers who come in, they have new priorities, and maybe being a diverse news organization is not necessarily one of their priorities. And I think uh, being able to challenge every single newspaper and television station in the country becomes very difficult, <coughs> but it then is up to the local audience um, because I think sometimes we take for granted, or the audience takes for granted its power in in demanding certain things, or at least questioning, why don't I see more of this, or who's who's running your newsroom, or when you visit a newsroom, look around, see who you see, see who's not there. I think all of those things are important in terms of what individuals can do as well. And let me give you a, a stinging example. <coughs> the, my editor, uh, Max Frankel at the New York Times, in ni 1985, issued an order. He, he saw how bad things were at the Times. We had gone up and then all of a sudden it just, there was just not much momentum. Max Frankel said, okay, Here's the policy of the newsroom, one for one hire. For you editors, sub-editors, you hire one white person, you match it next time with a black, with a non-white person. And guess what? Didn't work. The editors stopped hiring anybody. <laughs> and obviously, that, this went on for a while, and it turned out that you know, you got to hire people. You got to replace people, retirees and people who leave. You need staff, but they were not hiring. And Max threw up his hands and said, "Okay, go on, hire whoever you want." And then, of course, but that was the kind of resistance that. Uh, but it's important that to also to bring up the other, as I did when I was in my remarks earlier, about the counter to that approach, which was used by Gannett, which was 
we're going to tie, to tie your progress on diversity to your paycheck. <coughs> So therefore, when a Max Frankel says something at the New York Times, and it's sabotaged by the middle managers, they're only hurting themselves, because, because they're, they're, it's going to show up in their evaluation. Mm -hmm. So tying, and that's used in other industries as well, tying people's evaluations and their paycheck to specific objectives. And when diversity is one of those objectives, people pay attention, more attention to diversity. So that's not at the New York Times, but not at the New York Times because they didn't adopt that <laughs> they model. Did. Well, the, yes, they did. About that was, that was part of it too. That yeah, that uh, your um, that was that was one of the the written rules, but it was never enforced. Mm. So policy. So nobody routine. nobody lost his job. Nobody lost his got a pay cut, et cetera. So it mm. was uh, and, and it, it, you know it was ignored most of the uh, yeah. those edicts. Um, uh, well, I had a comment and then a question. First comment is, um, my mom always told me, misery loves company. And so I just wanted to say that it was somewhat relieving um, to hear you say the experiences in the journalism world for black people, which are very similar to the experiences in academe, <laughs> yes. those of no. isolation, those mm -hmm. of tokenism, mm -hmm. and those other things, and always seeming like you're fighting a battle and nobody can hear it. Right? Nobody can see it. Nobody's on your team. Um, but the question is, do you foresee any time um, in, in the journalism field where black women will be allowed to be on TV and accepted with natural hair? I see so many mm -hmm. black women <laughs> in all these you know, um, different major cities, and they all have a long, straight, European-looking weave. Right. <laughs> so um, I've written about that, um, as a matter of fact, and um, I do foresee a time it's very slow. So for example, um, if, if you look on CNN, there is a woman who wears braids. Now they're probably extension braids, they're not locks, they're not natural hair. But this is a source of conversation at conventions that we go to at NABJ every, almost every year. We do sessions on, okay, hair, makeup, what's, you know. And so I guess to answer your question, am I hopeful that it's going to happen in my lifetime? I don't think so. But will it happen eventually? Maybe. So let me give you an example. So in South Africa, I mean, I mentioned that I go there and um, I noticed that on television, they too are wearing weaves. Um, and so this is how racism works, right, and how colonization works. It makes you think that something's wrong with you. But what's interesting about in South Africa is that there is a much wider variety of styles. So even though you may see women with weaves or wigs or extensions, you also see weaves, you also see women with natural hair, with short hair, with no hair, with um, uh, headdresses that they, they will wear mm. during a report. Um, we have trouble just having a, a reporter wear a hijab in this country, right? So let alone natural hair. So will it happen? I, I think eventually. But what has to happen is people who are in control, who are the gatekeepers, have to say it's OK, right? And, and you can have even some black news directors say, no, I'm sorry. Um, I know my audience. My audience is not going to allow you to be on air <coughs> with natural hair. So you got to. Um, th this happened to Renee Ferguson, who's a, a famous investigative reporter in Chicago. When she went on a Neiman Fellow, she decided to let her hair grow out. She came back, um, wore hair natural. The news director, who was a black female, said, I'm sorry, Renee, you're going to have to go back to. And again, so um, it's all about the money, right, or the perception of what will sell. The reality is people will get used to it if you actually do it, right? And so uh, I've, I had even some of the women in my research who work behind the scenes who told me I, I wouldn't wear my hair natural in, in the newsroom. I think, because, I th I because think. you know, there's going to be a certain image of who I am. I'm, I'm in charge. I'm a leader. And that image might change if I wear uh, natural hair. So it's still a real issue. Yeah, but I think it, 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 it might be the, the place also, Dick, you know that in Washington, you especially nowadays yeah. we, we see and Atlanta of course, too. Washington is called Chocolate City but it has uh, you, you see f uh, female black female uh, anchors etc with different also areas. if you have the cloud like Charlene Hunter Gall wears her hair natural right. and 
Nobody's going to tell Charlene. Right. <laughs> and then in, in Atlanta, yes. we had the famous Aunt Monica Kaufman who yes. wore a, a variety right. of styles. So right. I think it just takes some, some people to step out there and say, what's the big deal, you know, mm -hmm. as long as I'm looking professional. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, let's face it. Let, let's see what uh, somebody has told um, women in the news business now that they should wear every color and all kinds of patterns and what have you. When I was coming along, we were told only wear solid colors, don't don't wear, don't have a lot of jewelry on, it's uh, distracting. Now they do all of that, right? So something has changed in terms of telling what people, telling them what people can wear, except when it comes to black women in hair, right? So we, we have to ask ourselves, why is that? So that goes to the other point, and I think, um, as we talk about management, uh, what was alluded to in the video is ownership, right? So you heard her say, well, we don't own any of the places for the most part. And that has also been a very depressing, you know, we used to have the NAB, National Association of Broadcasters. They um, were working to try to get um, African Americans in as owners of television stations. Um, you know, the barrier to entry for a television station is huge. You know, it costs a lot of money. The good thing about the internet is that the barrier to entry is not as huge, but you still have to make money, right, in order to make it sustainable. So my hope is that in the future there will be other ways to distribute news uh, in a way that we haven't even thought of yet, and that those will be run and owned by people who really see what the future is looking like in terms of, um, you know, a majority minority, and that they're looking too, at the socioeconomic standpoint of people, because I think that's an area that we don't talk about enough. And I think that there is, in a lot of newsrooms, especially in larger markets, um, it, it's more elitism, right? Because they can afford to do certain things. I mean, in a city like Chicago, you know, they don't cover public transportation that much. They don't cover public schools in a way that they should be covering public schools. Why? Because their kids aren't going to public schools. Right, no, they're not. They're not taking public transportation. Post, yeah. Where almost everybody in the newsroom who lived in D.C. sent their kids to private school in mm. upper management. Right. And I remember one day the then editor getting on the metro, which he apparently never did, and saying, "Oh my God, everybody's reading on their phones." And I was like, "Dude, you're like five <laughs> years old. Right, right. You know, and we're right. in trouble. Right. They're all reading on their phones, and you know, they're just there's a lot of." My question is for Dr. Greenwell. Um, you mentioned that that uh, you were into broadcasting in in Chicago in the in the in the eighties. Um, how did uh, Harold Washington make an impact on um, representation in the newsroom? If he did. So I wasn't actually in Chicago in the 80s when oh. I was actually still in college. Can you believe that? In, 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 uh, for part of the 80s. Um, so but what's interesting about that is, you know, you had a lot of people certainly covering uh, Harold Washington as a first, you know, a first black mayor. Uh, and again, I wasn't actually in the city, so it's hard for me to really know sort of what the, the fever pitch was like. But from what I hear, uh, I think it was a time for the media to also look at itself and see who, who, did, who did they have on their political reporting staffs, right, covering this. So politics has historically, um, uh, let's see, Charles Thomas, who just retired, has been a political reporter at WLS at Channel 7 for many, many years. I suspect that he probably got his start around that time. So sometimes you have these momentous moments, you know, whether it's the riots, whether it's, you know, the Me Too movement, movement uh, whatever it is, those become very uh, important and sort of a watershed moment for those who are in control to really look around and say, well, who do we have who who looks like this issue or at least wants to cover this issue or we need to make sure we have more people who can provide us with a more variety of opinions on this subject matter. So my guess would be probably similarly uh, something like that probably happened when Harold Washington ran. Uh, Harold Washington, one of his first appointments <coughs> when he became mayor was a former, was a uh, Chicago Sun-Times reporter, Grayson Mitchell who died last week, oh, yes. um, and Grayson uh, reached out and made sure that uh, the, the, the people who Local were covering uh, sure. Harold Washington, uh, at least oh, some man. of them, go were non-white. But Chicago was a tough city. I lived in Chicago oh, for man. three years, and 
it was racially oh, I could God. not believe how bad it was. Yeah. I just it's on okay. I just wanted to say I read the report and I thought I was reading um, about today. Mm. Mm. I, I think, you, you know, the other thing is the, the, the report was also very detailed and in-depth. So they looked at, I think it was like 4,000 newspaper articles from cities from around the U.S. and nearly 1,000 video clips. So it wasn't, you know, let's just pick a few here and then come up with our uh, analysis. It was really taking a deep dive into um, newspapers as well as television news organizations and what they were actually putting on the air or putting in their newspaper. So I think that that's an important uh, point to make as well in terms of the rigor of the report. Mm -hmm. It's chilling. I think it just covered so many areas. Didn't it? Yeah. Right. right. It was yeah. Housing. Yeah. Right. All you have to do is plug in a few different words, right, for different groups, and you would think it's 2018. So that goes to that goes to your point, the gentleman right here is like. She's suggesting it didn't matter. Yeah. 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 I wouldn't say that. Out. Yeah. It, it made I a difference. It mattered. It made yeah. a difference. Yeah. Um, it's just that uh, it's like anything else. If you don't keep putting pressure on it, right, it eventually becomes not as important as it was the first day that the report came out. How would you? Yeah, I've got a question I'd like to go back to the notion of appearance uh, because I know for at least in the 70s and 80s the determination of how people looked on air was not made by the local stations but by consultants, consultants. Yeah. and I'm wondering about the consultant issue today and the pressures that are being put on consultants and uh, on multinational non-news organizations that now own news organizations. Well, yeah, I would say, you know, the consultant was the thing, right? When I worked in newsrooms, you know, we would know, oh, the consultants are coming today. They're going to look at your tape or your reel and tell you the type of stand-ups you need to do and how you should wear your hair and what color looks good on you. So it was very uh, superficial, right? Um, and, and at the network level, that happens even more, you know, because they have more money and more is at stake just because of the ratings. Uh, I, you know, I don't, my, my impression is that um, the consultants may not have as much influence as they had back then, only because news organizations typically don't have as many reporters as they used to have, and therefore they could argue that they don't have the money. Uh, and again, this is local, local news, not necessarily network news. But I think that there's still that influence, right? Because otherwise, you wouldn't go to every market and see sort of the same thing, right? Sort of the same look, the same kind of attire, the same voice, the same, you know, it, 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 it often is very similar from market to market to market. And that is a result of consultants who go into those markets and say, you should do this. And somebody in the gatekeeping role agrees because they think that's what's going to drive ratings. And, and so to some extent, right, um, who, who drives the ratings? The audience, right? So if the audience continues to watch, then the audience sort of approves of that and says, yes, this is what we want to see. Yeah, or they're in a news desert and they don't have any options. <laughs> True. So, I mean, the, the one thing that I told the panelists two weeks ago or the audience two weeks ago is you as an audience person have more power than you know. It is so easy now to connect with a news organization. They put the email address of the reporters or whoever. You go on the, the website of the television station or you can find the news director who's, who's in charge. Provide them with some critical feedback. And I don't say don't troll them, right? We don't, we don't want you to do that. But we want you to provide them with some critical feedback. So we used to say that for every letter we received in the newsroom, that was the equivalent of 10 people because the other nine people just weren't going to write. Now it's so easy. I would say for every email, it's probably, uh, I, I don't know, 100, 100 people out there who believe the same. So I encourage you to be more active and more engaged in news because it's part of our democracy. And if we don't have news organizations that provide fair and balanced and reflective coverage and ethical coverage, then what do we really have, right? If we can't trust our news media for a variety of reasons, then 
there's no reason to have it, right? Would you say would you say then that the uh, the media dropped the ball on Kerner when it came out because it it seems that the president swept it under the rug, didn't want to deal with it. How would you characterize uh, the media coverage of the report at the time and and where that led where that led us to and what responsibility they had? In I think all of that, that was wide uh, coverage. Um, because of it, the, the wording uh, and the criticisms uh, across the board, all sectors uh, of society. Uh, so the coverage was widespread, uh, but again, and there was some, some reaction to it, uh, that is positive reaction, hiring, but eventually it faded. Um, people for not forgot about the whole thing, but it uh, the the momentum uh, eventually something else took over the uh, Vietnam War, for example, uh, the Nixon uh, election, and then going into all of the s stuff in the 70s, Watergate, etc. So other things uh, uh, became more prominent in the news, but there was again immediate reaction, and I think some fallout uh, that dribbled uh, on for uh, for years. Mm -hmm. But overall, it just, you know, it, uh, most people didn't haven't heard of it. And, and I would say part of that, again, is your point exactly. So when I go into classrooms and I ask students, uh, how many of you have ever heard of the Kerner Commission report? Most of the time, I get a blank look, like the what? The what? What's the Kerner Commission report? So I think it's incumbent, and this includes at Northwestern and other journalism schools that I've been at. I'm not sure what it's like here, um, but again, when I talked to the students this afternoon, again, a small subset of the students here, most of them had never heard of it before. So I think part of it is that it's incumbent on us, um, those of us who uh, know about it, is to make sure that we, you know, sort of keep beating that drum and making sure that 10 years from now, when many of you are actually in newsrooms working, you're not, at the 60th anniversary, you're not right. saying, the current commission report, I never heard of that before. What, that, what, what is that about? We have a question over here. Uh, how did the reporting of the Kerner Commission compare to other commissions and reports of the time? Hmm. <laughs> uh, the, re the reporting uh, on it, uh, was 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 excellent. I thought at the time, um, by the uh, especially by the major papers. I may, uh, and I guess I don't know what it was like um, for the rest of the country. I don't know how the Evansville or the local paper covered it, but the major media gave it plenty of coverage at the time. It made a huge splash. Would, would you say? Yeah. Well, I guess. My recollection of that was that, uh, you know, you have to put the whole thing in context. We're talking about 1968. All right, in 1968, the Kerner Commission report came out, yes. But there was also the Vietnam War going on still. Martin Luther King was killed. Bobby Kennedy was killed. I mean, no, no one of these news stories about a report is going to command much attention for, for very long. Uh, so, yes, it might have had some attention at the, at the time. But I think the real legacy of that report <coughs> is in, in, you know, maybe some of the great society programs that, that were continued or, or a new ones started because of it. I mean, th they didn't have to have, uh, you know, news coverage of the report for it to have an effect. Mm -hmm. As long as some congressman or some local legislator said, maybe we should have some more programs to do this or that or the other. Or maybe media organizations said, yes, we're going to start a program and, and get some more uh, people of color into our news operation. Uh, since I have the floor, let me just also mention another thing, and that is that um, uh, we mentioned that the Kerner Commission was, a, was issued at a time when things were viewed as black and white, mm -hmm. Negroes and whites, Negroes and Caucasians. Well, now we have a multicultural, mm -hmm. more multicultural mix here, and the other, the other groups also have their own issues about representation that we should also be <laughs> conscious of. Uh, when I went to the uh, convention, let's say, of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, uh, a lot of the Latinas were talking about the differing standards in beauty um, and what's allowed between English-speaking television and Spanish-speaking um, television. 
and how they had to or not had to adapt. There's also the issue of language. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of in English, a lot of Spanish words are anglicized, mm -hmm. and um, they know how it's supposed to really be pronounced in Spanish. So, the, so you have that conflict. You know, I've got to corrupt the the the, uh, the pronunciation of San Antonio. You know, just to please English people who think that's the way. It, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Uh, we have a, a continuing lack of Native Americans, and that shows up uh, at in. in um, uh, coverage of, let's say, Standing Rock. It took a long time for that mm -hmm. whole Standing Rock controversy to make the network news. And then when you have si situations like the Pulse shooting or the Las Vegas shooting, you have statements made by, on the network news that this was the worst shooting, uh, the most deadly shooting in U.S. history. And the Native Americans would say, what? what are you talking about? What about <laughs> Wounded Knee? Or a black person would say, what about Black Wall Street? Or the situation, and, and there was a uh, big riot and uh, shooting of, of, of lots of black folks in Louisiana, or Tulsa, uh, because you don't have these people in the mix when these decisions are made. Uh, so there's a lot more to be done, and, and it affects a lot. And of course, we have Asian Americans and their issues about uh, you know their appearance and and the um, the noticeable lack of Asian American males on mm -hmm. <laughs> you know in in network television. So. This whole thing is, you know, it, it's, it's a lot wider now, and, um, uh, you know, the, the, while the, the commission report itself may not have been dealt with, these same issues are surfacing in other areas. And the last thing I, I, I want to point out is it's more than just a moral issue that, you know, they're not paying attention, blah, blah, blah. It's, it, 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 we have to keep pointing out that this is a business issue. You know, the nation is changing. People want to see their own issues and, their, and people who look like them reflected in the news. And if you don't do that, you are going to lose them as customers. And that is what needs to be underlined. It's not just an, an issue that this is something nice to do. If we have time maybe for one more yeah. question. Uh, well, I have a bit of a comment and a question. In terms of the context, washing everyone's consciousness clear of the report, there was also the Democratic National Convention. Oh, yes. Which was like a, it was like a televised riot by largely middle class people mm -hmm. being attacked by police. It was the police who were rioting. That was the commission report on it, if I recall that correctly. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask if whether the, the definition of news is, isn't part of the problem here. Once the report comes out with its dire warnings, there's no more news. I mean, if it's not acted on, uh -huh. that's not news. Mm -hmm. And it, it's kind of parallel to the dire warnings about, say, climate change. Uh, I guess when there's a bad storm, people could say that's news, but of course it's weather, not climate. So unless there's some organization constantly raising this issue, or perhaps unless there are continuing civil disorders, you've got no story. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that a problem with the definition of news? Well, I don't think it's so much a problem with the definition of news. I think it's... it's um, it's a problem in the sense that the country is changing and newsrooms don't, aren't representative of the communities that they serve. And so when you aren't representative, then uh, you're gonna miss some important stories you know, in those communities, or you're gonna say something that's insensitive or write something that's insensitive because maybe you didn't have people in those newsrooms who really uh, understand why certain language might even be uh, important. I, I do think that, um, Newsrooms are no different than any other industry or no different than individuals, right? We move when we're pressured to move. We'd like to all, we'd like to all get up and exercise every day, but some days we just don't feel like doing it, right? And so I think uh, whatever it is that motivates you to do something, it's that same issue with news organizations and those who are owners. And so I think when we look forward to the next 10 years, I won't say 50, <laughs> right, but the next 10 years, the question is, will it be any different? And I don't know if it will be. I mean, that's, you know, I, I know one of our, our persons on the video said, you know, I'm an optimist, you know, I, I'd like to believe that it's gonna be different. Um, I think it's only gonna be different if the young people who are in the audience today who decide that they're going to be journalists and that they're going to be gatekeepers, it, it will only be different if you all decide it will be different. You know, It's kind of like the students in Florida and Parkland. And that is they have decided that something's going to be different. And I think if you decide 
then it will be different. If you decide, if you don't, then it won't be different. You know, you know, coming out of the, after the current report, coming out of the, 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 the 60s, civil rights movement, going into the 70s, uh, I and a lot of my colleagues were really excited. Oh boy, things are gonna change. Uh, we look forward going into the late 70s and the 80s and certainly uh, nowadays. <coughs> I would guess I would categorize myself now as kind of a pessimist. I, uh, <coughs> you know, as I enter the late stages of my life, I don't expect too much to change, to be honest about it. But I hope so, and, 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 and I hope the kids at Parkland, I hope the kids here, the youngsters all across the country, will, will make the difference now. You have to because it's, it's up to you now. <laughs> it's yours. And one positive note, too, to end on is we have, um, uh, there are two Northwestern alums. One was a film major, the other was a journalism major. Um, they quit their jobs. One had worked at the Miami Herald, the other was a freelance um, documentarian, and decided to start a news site called The Tribe. And it's specifically changing the narrative of black Chicago. What they found was that mm. they were tired of seeing sort of the same old stories that were typically negative uh, and not balanced. So they started their own news website and they will celebrate their one year anniversary, I think this month. And so those are positive stories that I think that are out there and they go to the issue of ownership and the issue of, hey, if you, if you don't see what you wanna see, then you have to create it, right? Create it on your own. Do you have a last word, Richard? Well, just simply that, that I think that the issue uh, may be a little miscast because we're not gonna have the same media in the future that we have now. Um, you know, people are already starting, you know, more people are watching Netflix than, than watching some cable mm -hmm. channels. And people are on YouTube and we have the, the internet and, you know, so these networks and these legacy media uh, may not be, you know, all, all that in the future. So who knows uh, uh, what's going to happen and, and it's up to us to help shape that future. And it may not be the way the past has been in terms of which particular media are, are being used. Thank you all very much. Oh, thank, thank you. you. All right, thank you. Thank you.